Russia is the largest country on the planet. It straddles nine time zones, possesses half of the world's nuclear warheads, and it's the largest energy producer. But Russia is not the former Soviet Union. As third-term president, Vladimir Putin flexes his muscles at home and abroad. Can Russia be a superpower once again? This is him. Welcome to Empire, I am Marwan Bishara. Since the Cold War ended two decades ago, the new emerging Russia has been largely defined by two men, Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin. Yeltsin presided over the dismemberment of the old Soviet Union and the reckless privatization of the state's assets. Complicit in this decade-long Russian underhaul stood Western powers, eager to transform their old nemesis into a new ally. Washington saw this chaotic free-for-all as a new Wild West and assisted the plunder. Deepening inequality, mounting insecurity and disorder put a damper on the economic liberalization and increased the popular demand for security, stability and the rule of the law. To regulate the heist and limit the damage, a new brand of centralization through authoritarianism and populist nationalism was introduced to Russia by the Yeltsin clique in 1999. Some call it Putinism. Vladimir Putin is not a man you'd describe as subtle. The once and future Russian president wants to convey one message and one message only. Vladimir Putin equals power. He's an athlete, master of martial arts. He rides a bike, he's multi-skilled, like our country. So he is as well. Multi-skilled, positive, very handsome, and we simply love him. But lest you think these carefully orchestrated photo ops are merely a vanity project, they're not entirely lost at sea. Putin sees the Russian presidency as a metonym for the entire country. In other words, when you think of Russia, he wants you to think of this. Not this. The Yeltsin days may be long gone, but Putin knows the same problems still exist. While Russia does boast massive reserves of natural gas, coal, and oil, that's only good news when energy prices soar because the economy is dangerously unbalanced. A massive 70% of all exports come from energy sources or minerals, meaning the country is at the mercy of global commodities markets. Just as alarming, the Russian people are dying off at a staggering rate. Male life expectancy is a mere 59, and at this rate, Russia is set to lose 50 million people in the next 40 years. So it's no wonder Putin does everything he can to eliminate the impression of weakness. It also explains why he has never had any apparent qualms in crushing internal rebellion, which tries to challenge the power of the country. Hopes rose late last year of a newfound momentum for democratic reform. The campaign is only starting. We, Yabloko, are announcing a campaign for the constitutional and lawful dismissal of the Putin group from power. Critics of the Kremlin now openly describe political life in Russia as sovereign democracy. A curious state of affairs in which all the trappings of a democratic nation are readily apparent, but they exist purely to mask a fully functioning autocracy. I come out onto the street and see totally different things from what I'm told on TV, and that's it. For one thing, they've never believed Dmitry Medvedev to be the true leader of the nation. Critics look at the job swap with Vladimir Putin and see a puppet pretending to be president looked on with boredom by his master. But for the time being, Vladimir Putin doesn't give the impression he particularly cares. He's happy to continue this political marriage of convenience. He does what he wants, Medvedev does what he's told. 
One of the most vexing questions is how Putin has managed to weld together popular support with the institutions of state to create this domination of power. The single most effective way has been the threat of terrorist attack, whether it be real, fabricated, convenient, or a combination of the three. Major incidents like the Moscow theater siege in 2002 and the Beslan school siege in 2004 have left a powerful impression on the Russian people. These extremist attacks, among others, are what Putin and his supporters cite in order to justify his uncompromising approach to power. They believe it's not democracy that's under threat, it's Russia itself. I'm supporting Putin because he's the only one I can trust with my fatherland for my grandchildren and their children. We came here to congratulate him. We came to remind people that the Russian state has to be defended for it not to collapse, for it not to fall to pieces. If there's any doubt about Putin's commitment to this belief, just ask the Chechens. Putin's approach toward this breakaway republic has been entirely straightforward. He simply smashed it. Since 2007, Chechnya has been ruled by a former warlord hand-picked by the Kremlin, despite having fought against the Russians in the first Chechen war. And if anything, this partnership works a bit too well. During the election, one Chechen district awarded Putin a curious 107% of the vote, a fact no one in the Kremlin seems to mind. We What's more important is spectacle, consistency, and the projection of power. The rest has to wait. Joining me to discuss the state of play in Putin's Russia are Alex Pravda, lecturer and former director of the Russian and Eurasian Studies Center at St. Anthony's College in Oxford, and editor of Leading Russia, Putin in Perspective. And Andrew Wood, former British ambassador to Russia and co-author of Change or Decay, Russia's Dilemma and the West Response. And Edward Lucas, the international editor of The Economist and author of Deception, Spies Lies and How Russia Dupes the West. And last but not least, Alexander Nekrasov, journalist and former Kremlin advisor. Gentlemen, welcome to Empire. Alex, mm -hmm. let me start with you. Okay. Putinism, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? It means a construction of a clan network system of sharing wealth out among people in return for their subordinating themselves to power. It means a hierarchy of power. It means management of society <coughs> rather than politics of society. It means the avoidance of pluralism, the avoidance of conflict, because conflict is too risky for Russia. Order is the watchword, and order is the basis for his popularity, and he still retains that, largely not because he's delivered so well, but because the alternatives are far worse. And the alternatives are a picture of disorder, mayhem, chaos. Society in Russia never seems to trust itself sufficiently mm. to allow pluralism to bloom and to risk conflict and real politics. But after the Yeltsin years, perhaps a bit of authoritarianism is exactly what Russia needs? Well, Russia had authoritarianism under Yeltsin. It was a messy authoritarianism. It was an authoritarianism which didn't exist on a nicely coalesced set of agreements between those who were the tycoons on the one hand, who had the money and they were given business assets, and the politicians on the other. There was an uncertain relationship. Putin established, or rather re-established, the traditional Russian uh, setup, and that goes Soviet, pre-Soviet, that the state is the freeholder of assets, mm. business tycoons, aristocrats are leaseholders. And that's the agreement. And they serve their time, they do their bidding, they get the money. So he did that in a much more orderly fashion than Yeltsin. Edward, Putin a departure from Yeltsin or the extension of Yeltsin? I think Putin has his roots in the Yeltsin era, and although he likes now to say that the 1990s were a time of chaos and humiliation and all sorts of other bad things and Western interference and so on, we shouldn't forget that during these 1990s, he went from being an unemployed former secret policeman into being one of the most powerful men in Russia <coughs> um, via some very lucrative business deals and some very important government appointments. I think that we, in, the, in the 1990s, we saw the beginnings of election rigging, which has become elevated to an art form in mm. Russia now. We also saw, saw the, the resurrection of the old KGB under a new label, the growth in importance of the FSB, which is its domestic wing particularly which Mr. Putin headed. That's now one of the 
great organs of power inside Russia in, in a way is the kind of chief enforcer for the regime. So I think there is continuity, but I think it's also made things worse. He made things worse. I think worse he, than the Yeltsin years. I think that the Yeltsin years were bad chiefly because the oil price was very low. If Putin had had to deal with Yeltsin's oil price of below $20 a barrel, his record would be disastrous. If Yeltsin had had Putin's oil price of over $100 a barrel, we wouldn't look so harshly on Yeltsin. So he had this huge asset of high oil prices. Alexander? Putin years worse than the Yeltsin years? Well, the problem was that, and I was an advisor at the time, I was telling the Kremlin that there was a need to create a political system with a proper opposition, with proper institutions, and that's what Yeltsin didn't do. And I think that was the lasting damage that inf uh, he inflicted on Russia. And Putin basically is the product of that system. It is not uh, a system where somebody a leader of a party gets up the party ladder and becomes popular or tries to become popular. It's just appointments. Appointments, appointments. And that's why now we see that there are no political candidates that can actually stand in elections and have some weight or respect of the public. And um, that's another problem with the Russian opposition. There is no Russian opposition. These are all opportunists and chances who are trying to jump on the bandwagon. But why isn't there Russian opposition? Is it the Russians' fault? Because, as I said, system? under the Yeltsin, point. there was no political system, crea a proper political system created. You have to have candidates for the presidency who would look respectable, who would be interesting, who would have a program. But nothing like that was... You see, Yeltsin was paranoid in the last years in power. He was paranoid. He didn't understand what was going on around him. His family was running things. So I think that is the result of what happened in the 90s we see now. Are you talking more about the so-called managed democracy? That means that you have to create the political system from to the top down? We didn't have any democracy under Yeltsin. It was a stage managed democracy. It was, uh, okay, it, it had a bit of change because we had some sort of a parliament debate. Critics uh, were saying that the president did, didn't do his job well. But in reality, the real power still lay with the Kremlin. They did what they wanted, and Yeltsin was part of it. Don't forget, Yeltsin was a uh, member of the Politburo of the Soviet uh, Communist Party. He had that mentality of a Soviet politician. And um, I don't think he actually delivered on any of the promises he made. Do you get the sense that perhaps then Putin is a bit of a melange between Yeltsin and the Soviet era? Well, two things. No, nobody springs fully armed out of, uh, as if they were not part of history in, one, in that sense, of course. Um, I think we ought to be a bit careful about how much of the difficulties of the 90s we attribute to Yeltsin personally, mm. and also how uh, little respect we pay to the amount of evolution and development which actually did take place under his, his watch. The first liberal reforms introduced, economic reforms introduced under uh, Putin stemmed directly from the aspirations of the reformers under Yeltsin. There were more possibilities under Yeltsin of uh, developing a federal system which would work than have evolved under Putin. And I think the appearance of strength that we see in, in uh, the Putin system up until the very recent past was an illusion. A key to Putin's present uh, dominance is the difficulty in seeing alternative, is also a, um, an accusation, if you like. He's not coming in for a new term. Effectively, he's coming in for a fourth term. The one word we haven't mentioned here is corruption. And um, you asked Alex what's the definition <coughs> of Putin Putinism, and he gave a very good political definition. But I think there's also a kind of business definition, which is that the people who run Russia also own it. And this is an elite which, over the past 10 years, has managed to steal tens of billions of dollars in natural resource rents and in bureaucratic rents, bureaucratic rents being a fancy word for, for, for bribes. And this is obviously has its roots in the Yeltsin era, when things were also corrupt, and we had the scandals about loans for shares and so on. But this has intensified and grown to an absolutely extraordinary extent under Putin. And it's a really big question for me now whether that business model is sustainable. It seems to me it's, it's dependent on a high and rising oil price, because this bribe control, bribe sucking machine needs to be fed more and more every year. So it's impossibly a source of instability now, whereas it was a sort of source of stability earlier when they had more goodies to hand out. But why do I get the feeling that whenever we talk about Yeltsin, we talk about reform, and when we talk about Putin, we talk about corruption? I mean, I think we should get away from personalization. I mean, 
Russia is, of course, a highly personalized system. Alex, can you, can you escape personalization? Yes, I think we can, because if you look at, look at the Soviet history of mm -hmm. politics, and we don't go back to Tsarist times, but these are individuals grappling with fantastically difficult problems. The fundamental problem is this. If you want to keep together as one state such a disparate and large territory, underpopulated in the east for most of it, and the decision was made to keep even the North Caucasus, that could have been actually allowed to float into international mandate responsibility. We wouldn't have wanted Chechnya and Cohen thrown onto our response. But he decided to keep it, and Yeltsin decided to keep it, integral territorial integrity. If you do that, you are almost fating yourself to having a top-down system. And the experiments under Yeltsin of allowing the region's elections and so on didn't work. There's not the confidence to allow democracy and parties to be formed from below. So the notion of something coming from below and the notion of a loyal opposition is absent from Russian political traditions. It's just not there. So you think but Putin is, is a political so necessity? Putin, so Putin is trying to manage this given the basic requisites of keeping Russia together, which he and his clique have, have uh, pushed as unquestionable principles. If you decide to really decentralize the country and risk the chaos of democracy, then you could change Russia. I emphatically do not agree that Russia is incapable of a federal structure. Not incapable, very, very difficult. Very difficult, but then so is democracy. It is in fact authoritarianism. It's, it's yes. not that easy either. Mm. Um, it seems to me that uh, under Yeltsin, there were the possible beginnings of a federal structure. And the first thing that Putin did was to destroy that. Uh, it needed, obviously, enforcing the, the departure of those governors who had been elected earlier uh, and whose terms had expired. And there was, would have required a great deal of will. But nonetheless, there was at least the flexible possibility of a greater degree of federalism, which is necessary for Russia. I think to uh, be too seduced by the idea that he's kept on to Chechnya, for example, is, is uh, uh, rather dangerous. It's a Chechnya without Russians. But you see, the question is why, when there was a de facto independent Chechnya in the 90s, wasn't Chechnya let go? Let go? You think yeah. they would let go like the other former not? republics of the Soviet Union? They're a drag economically, in security terms. Well, maybe that was a good thing, maybe it was a oh, bad Chechnya thing. Chechnya was a gangster ridden republic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let them go on that. the international system. But well, you, you couldn't allow such a, such a uh, s situation develop in the Caucasus. We would have, been, we would have had an all out war there. So, so yeah. did, so did, two all out no, so no, did Putin, I mean all -out did Putin teach everyone a lesson with Chechnya, simply that? It was just a question of timing, and Putin has just become prime minister, and he decided. Well, he's kind of won the, he's going to teach he's, everyone he's a lesson. Won the battles, but he's lost the war, I yes. think, in that he has cracked down very hard on the visible manifestations of separatism. And so you now have Kadyrov and other regional leaders who play total lip service to Putin, but I actually think that he's, he's actually weakened the long-term prospects of keeping, keeping <coughs> Russia together by this kind of centralization and personalization and absence of real institutions. You have this bunch of incredibly rich people who control the money and the power at the top and who are detested um, yeah, in the regions. They have to dole out money and goodies and other things to try and keep, keep people loyal. But I think you've, and you've also seen the migration of Russians out of a lot of these regions, which used to be quite mixed with ethnic Russians and other people. And the eth ethnic Russians have been moving in large numbers out, out, of, out of the North Caucasus, with the result that it now, in, in a way, is not really part of the Russian Federation, except it's not, it's not subject to the Russian constitution, it's not subject to the Russian rule of law. All it really has is a kind of military um, modus vivendi, way of living with the Russian Federation, but it's not more than that. Uh, Alexander, do you think, hearing all of this, you think Putin is on the rise or is he on the decline, regardless of the election results? I think that, uh, first of all, all Western academics, experts on Russia miss one point, a very important one. Our country lived under communism for 75 mm. years, the most aggressive form of communism imaginable. You must understand, this is poison which goes into the system. To cleanse the system, you need decades. You cannot just come like Yeltsin and say, that's it. <coughs> Let's forget about communism. It's capitalism now. Didn't work. And it wouldn't work. And that's why I think that both Yeltsin and Putin are temporary figures. I know it's taking a long time. But in my estimate, it would probably take another 10 years for the generation change to happen and real changes start to happen. Second point, the West played a very, very negative role in the Russian development in these 20 years. 
If you see where the money is hidden, which was stolen from mm. Russia, it is hidden in the West. Mm. And when I hear all, all those stories, how the West wanted to help Russia change into a democratic state, I say rubbish. The West <coughs> proved to be an obstacle. I was an advisor in the Kremlin, and we had 120 foreign advisors, mm. Americans, Brits, couple of Germans. It was the Washington consensus time. But they were all horrible. Their advice Liberalization was Liberalization at and, any and, cost. And, and this sort of jump into privatization, mm -hmm. I was against it. I was saying this is going to end in disaster. So all these oligarchs who were created, you know who was advising them? Westerners, mm -hmm. Western bankers, Western lawyers. And they were telling them how to hide that money on offshore accounts and so on. And when I hear now, you know, some Western experts saying, well, they didn't do that properly, they didn't do that properly. I always say to them, give us our money back first, and yeah. then you tell us what to do. I, I agree with you absolutely. There was an enormous amount of Western naive optimism. Naive. About the tr you naive. Call naive. Offshore yes. accounts. Primi there was a search looking for a new panacea, a new formula which would actually solve everything at one, at one shot. And that was capitalism, liberal democracy, full marketization. Nobody, nobody thought like full that. Full marketization. That, that was, was the imposed answer. on the Kremlin by those advisors. Could we say there was a uh, Russian role and the West was complicit? There was always a split in the Kremlin yeah. between the pro Westerners, like mm. it was always in Russia, and the people who said, let's take it slowly, let's not rush mm. into these mm. things. But Mara, I think it's, it's, it, we're getting back into this familiar argument about who made what mistakes in the 1990s. And sure, there is plenty of blame to go around, but the fact is it, it's 10 years since the 1990s, more than 10 years since the 1990s. Putin, in that period, has had unlimited money and unlimited power. If he'd said, I want all Russians to wear blue hats and orange trousers for the good of the country, they'd have done it. And then look what happened. $1.3 trillion in excess oil and gas revenues have gone. Not invested, just gone. Wasted, stolen. That's not there. Okay with the complicity of the West, but the point for Russia is, what happens now? Where's this machine going? It's running, it's running on empty. It doesn't have that huge dividend of public trust anymore. It doesn't have the huge dividend of the oil and gas revenue. So what's, what's he going to do? And I think that's what we should be looking at. What Edward is saying, basically, is that there's a system of patronage where, you know, they were putting in his buddies on the top. But could he have, like, for example, during the communist system, tell people, the bureaucrats, not to steal? <coughs> the system is necessarily corrupt. Because, um, after all, if you are somewhere in the, in the feeding chain, you see that your boss pays no attention to the law, you're not going to either. This is a fundamental weakness of the regime, and it's a fundamental reason why there were a, so, such a large degree of protests uh, towards the end of this past year. Well, Those protests yeah. were tiny. Yeah. Nobody supports them across Maybe, the country. But, if you take these the are, these are but we haven't seen this before over the last 10 yeah. years. Okay, so they happen, but these are tiny groups of these people. Things, they have no support across start, the country, none. Things I'm started in small polls, ways, and the main that. point of the protest was in, in the indignation at the arrogance of power. Is, is there a Russian spring? On the no, that's a wrong analogy. Yes. But there's the beginnings of a, of a the new middle class we've all been waiting for for years is beginning to show a degree of self-respect <coughs> and saying to politicians, don't be as arrogant, don't be as dismissive of us. People are fed up with politics. And we're going to be looking at that when we come back after a news break. <laughs> Welcome back with my guests, Alexander Nekrasov, Edward Lucas, Alex Pravda, and Andrew Wood. The Cold War is hardly behind us, yet there is talk of a new Cold War with the Middle East as one of its familiar battlegrounds. The Kremlin has warned against what it terms Washington's destabilizing foreign policy, and Putin has publicly accused the West of interfering in Russian internal affairs and claims his re-election by almost a two-third majority as a victory against Russian foreign and domestic enemies alike. As he prepares to take over the Kremlin for the third time, there is no telling what Putin is thinking. Will he raise the anti-American rhetoric or pursue a more pragmatic course with Washington? Either way, the post-Cold War honeymoon has given way to a new geopolitical clash of interests reminiscent of past rivalries. <laughs> Day of high drama and momentous events in the current historic session of the United Nations. The Moscow's time, dealings with the United Nations have always been a little bit prickly. China. A drastic reorganization of the world body secretary. Whether it be Soviet leaders banging their shoes in 1960 or Russian leaders blocking resolutions today, 
The reason for the intransigence is the same, because of a deep-seated belief that Western powers were manipulating the United Nations to promote their own agenda. Last year, Russian diplomats made it abundantly clear that Western countries far exceeded a UN mandate to protect the Libyan people and used the justification of a resolution to topple Muammar Gaddafi, far beyond the original remit. When a similar measure regarding Syria came up for a vote earlier this year, Moscow refused to let it happen again. Russia will do all it can in order to prevent the situation in Syria, descending into a similar scenario to Libya. Since then, Russia has signaled a willingness to help resolve the Syrian crisis, but on its terms. Damascus and Moscow have long shared strategic interests and a sympathetic worldview, and so, while Russia's tone has softened, its opposition to Western interference has not. At its essence, Vladimir Putin's position mirrors most of his Soviet predecessors. He believes that someone must stand up to the perpetual interference by the United States in the sovereign affairs of other nations. And like those before him, he's happy to be the man to do it. Noted for their absence are the perestroika days of overly optimistic statesmanship. Uh, some believe that the weight of history uh, condemned our two great countries, uh, our two great peoples, to permanent confrontation. Well, you and I must challenge history, uh, make new strides, build a relationship of enduring cooperation. Once Vladimir Putin took office, the mood was certainly polite, but clearly more than a little awkward. We, we spent a lot of time uh, in our relationship trying to get rid of the Cold War. <coughs> <coughs> Elsewhere, Putin will not back down on issues like NATO expansion that Moscow feels are designed to provoke. And he doesn't much care for Washington starting turf battles by blatantly trying to poach former Soviet satellite states. A brief war with Georgia in 2008 was orchestrated to remind the West, not just Tbilisi, that Putin was in no mood to be pushed around. But he's also well aware how this plays at home. When he takes on a defiant neighbor or slaps down Washington, it only adds to the nationalist zeal that's backed him for 13 years now and counting. Like those who went before him, Putin seems happy to forge relations which irritate and sometimes anger the West. Today, Russia's status as one of the BRIC countries gives it the opportunity to build new diplomatic and economic ties with the emerging world. Early last year, China quietly overtook Germany to become Russia's largest trading partner. Welcome to the Prime Minister of the Russian Federation. With the economic balance shifting, Putin feels confident to do a little lecturing. Today, the pride of Wall Street's investment banks have virtually ceased to exist. They have suffered losses surpassing their total revenues of the last 25 years cumulative. This example, better than any criticism, describes the real situation. All of which demonstrates that, as far as Moscow is concerned, when it comes to dealing with the West, whether it be diplomatically, militarily or economically, a little bit of tension is never a bad thing. Edward, perhaps tensions, a bit of populist foreign policy, but a new Cold War, isn't that a bit of exaggeration? Well, it depends what you mean by it, but I think one has first of all to notice that Russia is not strong enough today to have a real confrontation with the West. The Soviet Union could just about do it, but went bust <coughs> trying to keep, keep up the effort. It's well worth remembering, for example, the Russian Navy now has only 20 seaworthy major surface ships and even those aren't in great, in, in great, in great shape. So the idea that they, you could have a full-scale um, confrontation over Syria, the way we did, for example, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, is just fanciful. What Russia can do is to use a kind of asymmetric approach where it does small but significant things that it knows will annoy the West. So, for example, in response to the American missile shield in Europe, it says it will put missiles in the Kaliningrad exclave next to uh, Poland and Lithuania, or possibly even in um, a bit of Moldova that's controlled by a pro-Kremlin regime. So it can do these small things, and it can use its veto at the Security Council. But it's quite hard to see where this ends, because Russia's not strong enough 
to be a real pole in a multipolar world. It doesn't really have any other allies. They don't want to be friends with China because they'll be eaten up. They can't be friends with the Muslim world. There isn't a kind of global anti-Western alliance that they can lead. So I think this is, this is a, in the end, is a bit, is a bit of a de dead end for them. The Cold War paradigm is a very um, misleading one. It's misleading for Russia because it leads them to place far too much emphasis on their relationship with the United States and to see the United States as somehow their natural partner, uh, which is not a reality. Their natural partner uh, in terms of trade and in terms of uh, 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 self-interest is more within Europe. Alex, it seems to me that uh, the Chinese-Russian coordination at the Security Council on the question of Syria there is a bit of support for that Russian standing up to the West. Standing up, but I think that, first of all, let's get rid of two issues. I think Edward was quite right. It's nonsense to talk of a Cold War that was a bipolar system in a different world uh, with nuclear weapons at its core. It's no longer the case. Russia is not the Soviet Union. It doesn't aspire to even be the Soviet Union outside the former Soviet space. But to think of it in terms of causing deliberate nuisance, of being a spoiler, I think it's oh, exaggerating the question. Mm. Russia believes in traditional geopolitics, politics internationally as a zero-sum game. It's not really a believer in positive-sum games out there, that everyone's going to end up in great friendship as we try to 1990-1991. Putin is on record consistently as saying, Russia is only respected when it's strong. And given American behavior in the Middle East and <coughs> elsewhere, that seems to be the American view as well. Strength is the only way towards global respect. China is the one exception here, which looks at economic resources and indirect influence. So the, the balancing uh, of the West with China and sometimes balancing with Europe against China, trying to co-manage Central Asia, these are all very traditional great power international politics. Nothing new and nothing deliberately based on the strategy of being a nuisance. No, Russia ultimately wants to be seen as an indispensable international actor, part of the traditional, it's a very conservative power internationally, mm -hmm. order-based system in the Middle East and hopefully globally. At the moment, it's a bi-regional power, both in Europe and in, in Asia. It's not a global power yet. Certainly, Alexander, it's no longer not only the global power it used to be, it certainly doesn't have any claims of a new vision for the world. Communism is gone, ideology is gone, there's more pragmatism now. Is just Russia developing into a new regional power? Russian foreign policy is still very Soviet. Now, people might not know this, but the people they're all from Soviet era. Lavrov is a typical Soviet diplomat. They could have achieved a lot in the past several years simply because the West has screwed up internationally. I mean, America is, 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 is as if it's, it's, it's working against itself. You're the, talking about the, Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, I'm and talking so about the whole lot, <laughs> the whole world. Uh, I also think that the financial crisis has suddenly revealed to everyone that the Western economic system, capitalism, does not <coughs> work. It's a corrupt, incompetent system. And to, to say about Russian corruption that, you know, tens of billions, as Edward was pointing out, stolen. Well, trillions were stolen in the West with this um, financial crisis. But certainly so you're, not, you're not saying that Russia is an alternative economic model. No, 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 it's not an alternative. I'm talk we're talking about foreign policy here. So this system has to change simply by removing the people who come from the old Soviet structures. If that does not happen, Russia would be still seen as a clumsy operator. Although, I must say, with <coughs> Syria and Libya, I think Russia has moved up a notch uh, on the international arena because I, I suspect that anybody, anybody sane person would say Libya and Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan are a disaster for the West. And there is a certain argument, uh, you know, sound argument, that Russia is pursuing a more reasonable, sober, foreign policy that does not want to see the world being too destabilized by humanitarian interventions and so on. To conflate Afghanistan, um, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Libya is, 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 is nonsense. Mm -hmm. The West is not responsible for what happened in, uh, not even really, in, in Libya. I mean, it, it acted within that, that framework, which is different. It's certainly not responsible for what's happened in Syria. But what Russia said is that the West has exceeded its mandate in Libya. It went from protection yes, to well that, changing that, regime. That is a particular point, and one can argue about that. But it is not the same thing as to say that what's going on in Syria is a result of Western in, in interference or uh, indeed that the West has any 
ability or desire to But to Russia does not Syria. want a Western interference in Syria because it's worried that this will lead to a complete breakdown well, I see that, in the region. Then, but then the West also, which is by which you presume to mean the United States, um, has every reason not to wish to, to, to begin to even think about involving in Syria. I think you've put your finger on this. <coughs> and there's, there's a streak of, of instinctive anti-Westernism in Russia, which can be quite distorting. Um, they, they, whatever the West wants must be bad for Russia, otherwise the West wouldn't want it. And as Alex said, this is sort of zero-sum thinking, which is, which is quite misleading. I do think you get much clearer confrontations, and one's got to separate this out a bit, in the former Soviet Union. You used in your report the very interesting phrase poaching, that the West was poaching former Soviet republics. Now, of course, those former Soviet republics don't feel that they're being poached. They think they're exercising their sovereign right to make the alliances they want. And so somewhere like Estonia, for example, um, or Georgia says, we suffered very much under the Soviet Union. We are still quite nervous about Russia. We feel that Russia would like to get us back, and we would like to be in a military alliance that can protect us. Now, that's not necessarily poaching. Russia may not like it. Um, but there's a clear difference in the way in which the West looks at the security of kind of wider Europe and the way in which Russia looks at it. Russia says this is our backyard and we have a say in what's going on. The West um, more or less says um, we count these as, as independent countries and we want to deal with them mm. as independent countries. I, I think there's a qualitative difference between what Edwin's quite right to be talking about which is the near abroad which are not properly foreign countries part of the former Soviet Union. In Russia's view. In, in Russia's view. But in view between that and mm. the Middle East. But again I'm not saying Russia, I'm not sympathetic to this, but one's got to understand where they come from. If you view from Moscow the Middle East, it is part of a kind of greater neighborhood. It, Iran bears on Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan directly bears on what's happening. Whereas for the United States, the Middle East is a faraway set of countries. So there must be a conspiracy, and this is the Russian view, behind all that to get at Russia in some sense. And I agree with Edward, there seems to be, be interesting what Alexander thinks about whether it's gonna change, an assumption that the West is out to get at Russia for some reason. But of course, Not but, but, but excuse, me, excuse me, the West has been mishandling policy towards Russia. Yes. Take NATO. Yes. Now, after the cold, everybody accepts the Cold War is over. Why should NATO be expanding eastwards? NATO was Especially created. Especially it promised it wasn't. Yes, it I was agree. created well, the promise to it didn't prevent promise, Soviet it Union it was never from, promised from attacking it was Western Europe. Verbally? Why exactly would it? Why? Exactly why? Could it be? I think so too. Because Russia, because these countries felt threatened by Russia. And the more that Russia says it is impermissible, Prima Kovsky, it is impermissible for you to join NATO. And as soon as someone says it's impermissible for you to put a burglar alarm in your house, you start thinking, yeah. how safe but is my house? Let's go back to Russia, the Russia, This wouldn't have happened without We should Russia. have got rid... In 1991, there was a big decision taken, I think a wrong one, for bureaucratic and cautionary reasons, to, to, to go on with NATO and expand it, or to go to CSE, OCSE, uh, OSCE, to actually change the security management of Europe. Organization of security. To no longer have... Standing alone, the Warsaw Pact had dissolved itself, it had and collapsed, it to have NATO. And the decision was taken to expand NATO. Now that militarizes yeah, relations. But the OSCE it was a option mistake. Was, was totally unrealistic. It was a it's major mistake. Untrue. Look, NATO was, <coughs> there was no decision made then to expand NATO. And for years, nobody wanted to expand NATO at all. And the whole idea of bringing former Soviet countries into NATO was regarded with horror no. by most NATO members. What made it happen was developments in Russia that made these countries no. feel nervous. But you recognize that Russia has a certain security preoccupations in its yeah. former Soviet Republic. I agree, but I interviewed an Estonian spy who was spying for the Russians. He was a very senior Estonian official. He, the Russian spy masters tasked him with finding out the secret NATO plan to attack Russia from Estonia. And he said, there isn't one. And they said, look harder. In fact, the truth was, at the time, there wasn't even a NATO plan to defend Estonia from Russia because NATO was so keen that Russia shouldn't think there was any kind of military, um, mil military threat. And I think that kind of exemplifies the way Russia looks at it. Russia thinks there must be some kind of hidden agenda. They must be out But of course it. there is a hidden agenda. You <coughs> cannot extend a bloc which was created to, to defend Europe from the Soviet Union and insist doggedly that all oh, those republics are feeling they're in danger. First republics, first of all, are playing their own games. Don't forget this. Oh. Georgia, Georgia was playing a game. Mm -hmm. And if you tell me that, that the Georgian troops attacked Abkhazia without American permission, I would laugh at they this. They didn't attack Abkhazia. I would laugh well, at they, this. They didn't. It was Ossetia. Ossetia, sorry. Know, I, 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 in 2009, sorry, Russia had major military exercises in 2009. Ladoga and Zaporozhye. Well. And these exercises 
the scenario was the invasion occupation oh you of don't the know States. this it first of all exercises are, are carried out across the world everywhere so uh, this is this is childish to say like that the strong, the details, no no the important point is this when the Cold War ended NATO said that's it done we are no longer enemies and then immediately practically immediately started Pushing eastward, and eastward, that is eastward. True. That this is, is true. There are two true. things that, that is not. If you have a nation, the way you put it is not true. Because it's not that NATO started as an organisation. First of all, it's not a bloc. It's not organised from allies. one centre. It is. Well, it's not just allies. It's yes. a consensus-driven organisation. Mm. It's not a bloc. Though it's natural for... Yeah, we've for seen it in Iraq, this consensus, yes. That wasn't NATO. Uh, but that just NATO. Well, you know, but America and Britain are NATO. NATO is America. That is my I just point. want to make one fundamental point, which I think agrees with you. If you have a nation state prone to fear of threats and paranoia because of historical, keeping going mm. a military bloc which was founded to oppose that state is going to invite threat perceptions. And you're right, they are, are exaggerated. Estonia is conspiring, this is conspiring, Latvia is conspiring, is conspiring. Why we don't get rid of the military nature of our relationship in Europe with Russia puzzles me. And uh, this, this is true. This was supposed, to, it was supposed to keep the Germans down and the Russians <laughs> out. Well, well, well that's the Germans are also, also helpfully divided. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Today, you mean? N no, then. then. Well, then. so, but so but what's the point of the military dimension of the course it, it, is, of of course it is a different uh, situation. Of course, uh, Russian perceptions are uh, understandable um, if factually mistaken. Uh, of course, we've all got to, to uh, try to develop new perspectives, whether oh. it's in, in Moscow or in Tallinn or in London or whatever. That ought to be a, a proper process. The, the expansion of NATO um, actually militarily has weakened the alliance, not, not strengthened it. But, uh, I agree with that. Now, to, to go beyond the immediate and NATO into the broader Middle East, where that's where <coughs> apparently the disagreement is, and historically the Cold War as well, there's also a bit of neglect that Russia, Alex, you were talking about the history, that it had history with the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. It does feel there's a threat from a growing Turkey, from a destable Iran, mm -hmm. from the nuclear issue, from the so-called Islamic <coughs> expansion issue. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are important for, for Russia. And it, perhaps it does have a, a right <coughs> to put it, it, its, its, its foot down when it comes to major changes in the I don't know about the right, but it has vital interests. Mm -hmm. and, and Europe could claim just about having vital interests. America, quite honestly, cannot claim vital security interests. Its interests are in oil and in energy and in global in it, um, management. So Russia has a, has a legitimate interest in being a major player in the greater Middle East as long as other external actors are involved there as yeah. they are. And Russia still remembers the great mistake of 1967. Remember that? It lost one hand. It, it finished diplomatic relations with Israel and from then on suffered under the disadvantage of having the Americans who had both Israeli and Arab uh, strings to their bows, and the Russians only add Arab strings. At the moment, Russia still has pretty good technical and arms relations with Israel and economic relations with Israel, as well as <coughs> trying to have relations with other Arab, but, with but Arab states. But that is precisely the point. Alexander, perhaps y you could recall that in most of these cases, when it comes to Iran and Turkey, Israel and the Arabs, Russia was always happy in this duality of conflict among most of those who it, it deals with. It never really wants to resolve anything. It likes to manage crisis and interfere in them. Well, I, I don't think it wants to actually see conflict. Uh, no, uh, manage uh, conflict. Well, m even manage conflict, because manage conflict becomes unmanageable sometimes very quickly. When, when did Russia try to resolve any question in the global Middle East? Well, uh, behind the scenes, oh, a lot of times. I, I remember myself when we were sending uh, diplomats there to talk and try to resolve issues. I mean, Syria, Syria, okay, there was a delay. They should have acted earlier <coughs> in Syria. They should have gone to see Assad earlier than that. But th th that was a clear-cut case. Uh, with Libya, by the way, but there were extensive talks behind the scenes when Russia tried to convince Gaddafi to move out. And um, no, I wouldn't agree at all with that. And even, even the Israeli-Palestinian problem, Russia is taking uh, an active stance mm. on that. So no, 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 it's, it's trying to help. Is there a legacy to be talked about now, 13 years on, perhaps another four more years of Putin on the foreign policy on the domestic front? Now would be a good time for a fresh start, in fact. But I think that, as you... Do you think he's capable? I think the, the problem is that the, the regime is addicted to anti-Westernism at home as, a, as, a, as a, a kind of media trope, as a way of whipping up the crowds. As you but but, but, but so it also can manage it 
whenever it's well, convenient it's, for it. But it, it shifts, it, 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 it closes off some options. It becomes, I mean, they're, they're having great difficulty <coughs> at the moment because they've got an air base in Ulyanovsk, which is helping the Western withdrawal from Afghanistan. Mm. This is something the regime wants. And it's because they've whipped up so much anti -Western, Westerners and the locals now are saying, we don't want a NATO base here. So there's, yeah, there, there, are there are costs to this policy. I, th I think the key thing we should be really looking at is the um, Russia's ability to play divide and rule in Europe. I think that's the, 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 where these things really matter. They don't have great purchase in the Middle East. They don't have a tremendously important relationship with the United States now, apart from some things to do with nuclear weapons. Where they can really exercise policy is in Europe. Can and perhaps get, power, too, with all the energy. Uh, with a mixture of energy and contracts, buying you know, aircraft, assault ships from France, offering gas contracts to the Netherlands and Germany. That's where Russia is punching it about its right weight. And I think that's, uh, and, and although they do this rather incompetently and often don't get good results, that's the, that's the place that I'm most worried about. I think the European, about? yeah, I think Russia is essentially and always has been a European country. Um, increasingly, because of the population movement west, it is essentially European. It does have the energy links we all know about, the trade links, but it's under-institutionalized as a relationship. And the Russians traditionally have not been able to come up with the imaginative ideas. We had Medvedev's idea <coughs> of a new European security. That won't work. It's up to the Europeans, and this is a huge opportunity, to get our act together and to look at the ways in which we can create a new framework of a greater Europe, in which we include Russia and Ukraine and the western parts of the former Soviet Union. That's the only way we're going to have a stable relationship. This sounds very constructive to me, and I would love to end on this note. Very constructive. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining Empire. And I'll be back with a final thought. It feels like a lifetime since Bush looked into Putin's eyes and was able to get a sense of his soul found him straightforward and trustworthy. Putin had Bush at Priviet. It was love at first sight. But as in the James Bond classic, from Russia with love, smooth talk and sophisticated mannerisms only hide plots and counterplots. The escalation in Chechnya and Georgia, like Iraq and Afghanistan, spoke louder than words. And soon after, Obama and Medvedev, hardly the alpha dog duet that Putin and Bush projected, have tried to calm the tensions and bridge the differences between the two superpowers. Now that Putin is back in the Kremlin, watch not for what he and Obama say, watch what they will do. More tellingly, listen to the silence of these two restrained political animals. Like speech and rhetoric, silence has its rules, and sometimes it can be deafening. And that's the way it goes. Write to me at empire at aljazeera.net. Until next time.